In chapter one, we looked at why we use statistics. We looked at the difference between populations and samples and the different levels of measurement that we use with statistics. In chapter two, we're going to go a little bit further into describing data and how we present our data using graphics and other forms of representation of the data. And if you need to, you can review back on your video from chapter one to see what the objectives are for chapter two as well, because they were all listed in chapter one's video. So let's begin. We have frequency tables and bar charts. A frequency table, just think of it as a frequency as counting. It's showing a grouping of qualitative data in a mutually exclusive class as showing the number of observations in each class. And if you look at page 148 of your text, mutually exclusive means the occurrence of one event means that none of the other events can occur at the same time. So if we have the frequency table of cars sold by, a loca by location, we can find that 52 cars were sold in Kane, so the Kane store, and then the Olean store sold 40. So if Kane sold a particular car, that means Olean can't sell the same exact car. Now they could say the, sell the same model and type of car, but they couldn't sell the same exact car. So they are mutually exclusive. And so again, when you think of frequency, think of counting. How frequent did this occur, or how many times did this occur? And then the bar chart is a graph that we use in which the classes are reported on the horizontal axis and the class frequencies on the vertical axis. The class frequencies are proportional to the heights of the bar. So if you see in our frequency table here, what we've done is we've just taken that and turned it into a bar chart by showing Kane's 52 cars in the first column, Olean's 40 cars in the second column. Now with this particular situation or scenario, you'll notice that it's a little bit hard to tell exactly how many cars Kane sold last month. Since we only have four locations, it's possible that your b better choice would be to go with the frequency table. And it again depends on how you want to present your data and to whom you're presenting it. So you want to keep in mind your audience when you're preparing your presentation of data. Also with most programs such as Microsoft Excel or SPSS or other statistical programs, you can change the level of precision that's shown. In other words, we could show individual tick marks and we could then see that it was 52 cars for Kane. The other point of the bar charts is it's a quick representation of who's doing better than who the other, which is the locations is doing the best of the uh, group or which is doing the worst of the group. And if you had quite a number of different locations you are looking at, it would be a lot easier to see it visually on the bar chart than it would in the frequency chart. Now we could take these frequencies and convert them into relative class frequencies. And what we're doing there is showing the fraction of the total number of observations in each class. So if we take a look here that Keen or Kane, excuse me, sold 52 cars, that's 28.9% of the total number of cars, or in this case, in decimal format, it's 0.289. And likewise, for each of the other ones, you can do that as well. So the relative frequency captures the relationship between the class total and the total number of observations. A pie chart shows us what part of the whole does each piece comprise. For example, our prizes are 60% of our budget. And our education is this amount, which is 60 to 89, or 29% of our budget. Many statisticians frown on using pie charts because it becomes very difficult to distinguish the dis or discern the differences between two values that are close in uh, the amount or the proportion of the whole. For example, bonus slash commissions and operating expenses are fairly close in size. It does look like bonuses slash commissions are greater, but we're not 100% sure of that. Likewise, it's 
as you get more and more values, more and more pieces of the whole pie, it becomes difficult to discern the actual value of each of the pieces of the pie. Another way we can represent data is using a frequency distribution. And there we use the frequency distribution to create classes of values. And we group our data into each of these classes. Now, when we use a frequency distribution, we do lose some level of granularity in that we don't know exactly, we know that eight observations fell between $200 and $600, but we don't know exactly where they fell. Were all eight of them at $201, or were all eight of them at $599, or were all eight of them somewhere in between or spread out evenly? We don't know that. But when we have a large number of observations that we want to assess, a frequency table can do a good job of providing us with some level of granularity and still give us the observations or the display that we want where we can discern a little bit more about information about our data. When you are using software to create a frequency distribution such as Minitab, SPSS, or Megastat, the software will have a built-in calculation in order to create the class interval, the class frequency, and the class midpoint for your frequency distribution. Our Lin textbook provides us with a method to use if you're trying to manually create a frequency distribution. And this is the first of a couple of reference pages that I'll provide for you, where if you wanted to calculate it out manually, you can use the Lind method that, they, uh, that Lind provides for you. And this you can find in chapter two of your textbook as well, this example. So Lind provides us with the two to the K rule as it's called. And that is not their design or Lind's design, but it is the, what they provide for us in the book. And again, these are for reference. If you wanna work through this exercise, you can do so. The Megastat program that we all installed in our Excel as an add-in uses a different calculation therefore you'll find that if you use the frequency table in the megastat you'll get a different result from what you would get with the 2 to the k rule and I'll provide the rest of these reference pages for you and you can pause the video if you want to review them If you'd like, you can click on the YouTube link in your slides, and that will take you to an example where I walked through the frequency distribution exercise. Just one note, the volume on that YouTube video happens to be pretty poor. You can go back in and increase the volume when you listen to it.